Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. There's been a lot of interest in growing hemp in Ohio since it was legalized last summer. And we've been patiently awaiting the release of the rules that will govern how we can become licensed to grow it. ODA recently released those rules and the licensing process will start soon. So today we have Lee Beers joining us to share more information. Welcome, Lee. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Lee Beers, I am the Ag and Natural Resources Extension Educator in Trumbull County. So Lee, you've kind of become one of our resident experts in hemp. Um, What's your background that you've taken an interest in that? Um, well, I was getting a lot of questions, and there is not that much information available, so I chart to do as much research as I possibly could. So you guys um, have some interest up in your area. I remember being up there with the Miss Campus um, project and fiber, and there's possibly a plant that's going in. So um, is that why you're seeing more questions up your way? Yeah, with the low crop prices, there's a lot of interest to diversify a lot of crops in our area. And a lot of our growers in northeastern Ohio are more willing, I think, than many places in the country to try new things. And the planned fiber processing plant for hemp in Pennsylvania is also spurring quite a bit of interest. So maybe we should talk about um, the two different avenues that hemp production will um, feed, I guess, the CBD oil and the fiber for people who might not be aware of those two markets. Yeah, so there are a million and one uses for hemp. Um, The big interest for profit is in the CBD, or that's where it was originally, because uh, you were looking at maybe $4 per percent of CBD per pound, Um, but those prices have since come down. Uh, There are, like I said, a million and one uses for hemp. Fiber is one of them. Um, Seed production for food. Think of hemp oil, same you would use for vegetable and cooking oil and things like that. But fiber, um, until we get the infrastructure built up, it's going to be a little while before we see any long-term use of that. It's pretty amazing. I know I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago in Kentucky, and one of the guys there said that hemp is perhaps going to turn out like a pork product where you know they always say you use everything but the oink. <laughs> And, and we've seen hemp pop up in all sorts of consumer products just in the last yeah. few months, it seems like. I've noticed it, like you mentioned the food products. I didn't even think about that. I was looking at something the other day and it said it had hemp in it. I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's used for soaps in Europe. They use it to make car parts. They make fiberboard out of it. It's a very diverse product. But you mentioned prices have gone down. so. I think a lot of people were excited about this because it could be another crop they could produce, but we've seen a lot of market activity in a negative way lately. Yeah, so if you're growing it for CBD, you're essentially paid for it on the percentage of CBD in your in the crop. Um, the average in Kentucky and Ohio is about 5 to 7% CBD. Contracts were paying on that percentage by the pound. So if you had one pound and you got a contract price of three dollars per pound you get three dollars per pound based on the the cbd concentration Um, those prices have since dropped Uh, if you have a contract that's over a dollar you're doing pretty good Um, prices have dropped significantly with the oversupply and overproduction of of hemp in 2019. yeah so thinking about that more realistic price outlook in the market you know i've I've seen the rules for oda and it seems like there's a very in very high upfront cost for producing this crop. Could you share a little bit about about the rules and how how much it would cost on average to produce them? Yeah, so you are looking at, ODA has a minimum of 1,000 plants and you have to plant at least one quarter of an acre um, or a, if you're growing indoors, it has to be in a, a set square footage. Um, if you are growing it outdoors, you're profitably going to be at 2,000 plants or more. Um, That's where most people are going to find the sweet spot if you're in that 2,000 plants per acre. Um, Some plants are, you know, $20 a piece. Some seeds are $3 a piece. So you're looking at approximately $6,000 per acre just in hemp plants or seeds per acre. That doesn't include equipment, labor, 
irrigation, all of the other things that go into it. So it's a very significant investment um, that you want to make sure you have a contract in hand before you start putting anything into the ground. So there's also a, a licensing cost associated with planting hemp. Yes, so the license is going to be um, $100 just to apply um, and your annual license of $500 for each growing location. So if you have multiple locations, you have to have an additional license for that location. Um, and you all also have to pay to have it tested on a regular basis because as the season grows, goes on, CBD percentage will increase. But because CBD is part of the process to make THC, which makes marijuana, if you go too high in the CBD, you'll cross the 0.3 threshold that makes it legal um, for industrial hemp. If anything above 0.3, it's technically considered to be marijuana and it's illegal. I was uh, listening to some information and on the rules and regulations and you mentioned the 0.03 or 0.3. 0.3. 0.3. Um, so I guess there's some leeway there. If you hit 0.5 and under, they won't give you a, a mark against, which you can have like three marks in 10 year period or three strikes, I guess would be a better way to put it. But if you're above the 0.5, then you get a strike against you. Yeah, so those, the Department of Agriculture is not gonna make you a criminal if you were 0 0.4, um, but you want to target for that 0 0.3 and anything above that is technically illegal. Um, what they do have in place is called a measure of uncertainty because any of the testing equipment will have some measure of error. So that machine testing that THC will have that measure of uncertainty available and posted. So if you had it come in at uh, 0 0.32 and the measure of uncertainty is um, 0.06, you would still fall within that, even though it's above 0 0.3, you're within that measure of uncertainty and it's still legal. So one of the best ways I understand that we can try to stay below that threshold is by selecting varieties that we know aren't at as much of a risk to jump over that threshold. I, it's kind of a challenge because I don't think we know a whole lot, a lot about some of these varieties. Do you have any insights on, on some that are, are legal and... Yes, so you kind of have to walk the line between high CBD production, but not too high. Because again, you're paid on the CBD percentage, but if you go above 0 0.3 and it's tested above 0 0.3, you can have your entire crop destroyed. Um, ODA, is my understanding, is this year they're not going to put any limitations on varieties. It, uh, growers are being encouraged to look at New York, Kentucky, other states that have a longer history and look at some of the varieties that they have out there. Um, but there is a huge varietal difference um, in terms of disease resistance, um, CBD production, um, a whole host of things. Yeah, there's um, a lot of regulation that growers need to be aware of, and I don't think that we have time to get into all the details today, but that information is certainly out there. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned the seed and whether they're getting plants. And something that I've come across is there can be people out there selling it. Um, you just need to be careful of the source because it may not be a verifiable source or something like that. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you know what you're buying. There's been a lot of um, news stories about other states where people have been selling seed, taking the money, and then next thing you know, you have essentially a marijuana plant. Or um, you will buy what's called feminized seed. It should only be a female plant because um, industrial hemp and marijuana, um, it's either a male plant or a female plant. And for CBD production, you only want female plants. So there is a process to make the, all the seeds feminized, but you have to go on the, the faith of that dealer to say, okay, I trust that these are actually feminized seed because even when you're paying three, four, five dollars a seed, you want to make sure that's truly feminized seed because if you get the male flowers, you're not going to get any CBD. So how can a grower ensure that they're working with someone who's legitimate? Um, I would ask for references. You would want to talk to other growers um, that have had good success with the company providing either the clones or the seeds. I would not go on faith of just ordering things online um, because it, it, it'll burn you. 
So we're looking at 2,000 plants per acre, um, about $6,000 just in seed costs. Um, what about the difference between seeds and starts? Some people use, um, people are using both. Yeah, so that you're using both. Um, I think you'll probably see starts or clones um, be used more widely uh, just because you kind of have an understanding about where those come from um, <clears throat> because you're essentially making a genetic clone of the parent plant which you kind of have an, a pretty good idea of what that THC and CBD levels will be. You have an idea of also of what the disease package will be with those clones. Um, so you can buy individual plants that are clones. Um, so think of small potting plants that you would get from the hardware store for your garden. And the minimum size that you, I'm just imagining it's like planting your garden. You know, are there any types of equipment available to, to help you plant these starts? Um, yeah, so if, if you're planting starts, you'd want to think about how do you plant tomatoes or um, how do you plant tobacco? Uh, so things like that, you know, vegetable transplanters, it's gonna be a very specialized crop. You're not gonna go through and put this through a grain drill mm -hmm. if you're growing it for CBD. You can put it through a grain drill for fiber and seed, um, but if you're trying to grow it for CBD, it's gonna be very much a specialty crop. Yeah, I saw a planter down at the farm machinery show that was set up for for hemp, and it had you know rolled the plastic out behind, and it was pretty neat, but I don't think it would, it definitely would not work for the small plants, just for the seed. Right. So this is not something that a corn and soybean farmer can transition into easily without equipment investments? Right. So if you are coming from a background of growing corn and soybeans, your easiest transition into the crop would be for fiber or for seed production. Um, you can use a standard grain drill to plant it, um, again, because you're, you're looking for biomass at that point, and you're going to have different varieties, and you can just plant it. Um, like you put wheat down, um, except you're going to be actually planting about a week or two after corn for that. Uh, you can harvest with a combine. There's some difficulty with that uh, if you're trying to get the seed. If you're trying to get the fiber out of the plant, if you have haymaking equipment, disc bind, um, or even a sickle mower, the old-fashioned sickle mowers are finding to be very effective um, because anything that you put through the combine with a fiber plant typically will wrap up any pulleys or belts and it causes some machinery problems there. Are there any fiber plants in the U.S. right now? Yes, so there's quite a few fiber plants. Um, Alberta, Canada has a pretty good start on us and the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington there and even Colorado, they're starting into the fiber processing plant. So what's the market like for fiber? you have to be able to sell it and currently there's no reliable outlet to get rid of it right now okay so we're hopefully going to see some plants come online like the one out your area yeah so th there's the plan to put one in just across the border in pennsylvania in, in the new wilmington area um, but to put in a fiber processing plant each individual plant is about 150 to 200 thousand dollars so it's a pretty significant investment for somebody to buy the equipment to process hemp and if you're going to be doing a large volume you're going to be buying multiple processing plants so you're looking at easily half a million dollars or more to just to get started and do those plants have a good market for what they're producing out of it uh, maybe you know? maybe <laughs> okay. yeah it's it's an unknown because hemp is used pretty widely throughout the rest of the world we don't have a very good handle on what hemp would look like in the United States because we have not had access to it in volumes for many, many years. So it's going to take a while to build that infrastructure and also build the markets to, to be able to make it profitable for farmers. Yeah, I think of the three, that one does seem like it's the most promising, though, when you look at how versatile it is in the rest of the world. And we could use it for paper and rope and things that we've we've not been able to in the past yeah so fiber i think is probably going to be the the biggest gains in the market going forward because cbd right now is saturated um last i heard we we're about seven times more production of cbd than we're consuming in the united states and that was without ohio and several other states still not producing hemp so now we're going to have even more production coming online 
I don't see CBD re rebounding anytime soon, but there is a possibility for hemp as a fiber product to increase market. So bottom line, before someone makes the investment to grow it, they should really know where they're going to go with their product, like any specialty product, really. Yeah, so if you th are planning to grow hemp and just put it in the ground and hope to sell it, uh, you're going to have a pretty big shock um, come harvest time next year, or this year. A lot of people tried to do that, and they actually had a hemp auction in Tennessee, and for some of the fiber and other products, they actually shut the auction down because people were not getting the prices they wanted for it. And the CBD market also has been um, challenging. There's a lot of growers with hemp still hanging in their barns, waiting to either get paid for it or find a place to sell it. I think, yeah, that meeting that I was at at Kentucky, there was a prisoner there talking about hemp, and he had asked how many folks had grown last year, and there were about 10 guys. He asked how many were planning on growing in 2020, and no one raised their hand. Wow. Um, the stories of they thought they had somewhere to sell it, they had contracts, and that falling through was, was somewhat heartbreaking. And the advice that they were leaving folks with at that meeting was, you shouldn't invest more than you're willing to lose until we really see how this is going to play out long term. Yep, and I think that's probably a, a good advice. If you're not willing to lose the money, um, I wouldn't be putting it into the ground in 2020. Uh, especially with so many other states coming online uh, with their hemp products. I don't, like I said, I don't think it's going to rebound anytime soon. The, the CBD market, again, do not put anything in the ground without a, without a contract. And what I've heard is some contracts don't even have a price point. They're just guaranteeing they will buy it, but they're not guaranteeing what they'll actually pay you for it. Wow. So... I mean, it sounds like there's hope for the future for this. We just need to get some of these fiber plants up and running, and hopefully we'll have a market for that end product. Yeah, so this time last year, everybody was looking at the prices before <clears throat> the states made it uh, legal. So Kentucky, Colorado, Pacific Northwest, and a few other states were producing CBD, and they were making pretty good money on it, uh, $4 per pound Per percentage of CBD. So if you had 5%, you're looking at about 20, 20 some dollars per pound of 5% CBD. And if you're getting 2,000 pounds per acre, it adds up really quick. When that price drops, your input costs are still the same, but you're not getting that back out of it. And when all the other states came online, that price just dropped drastically um, around August, September of 2019. I'm hopeful that you know maybe that price will come back up as we better understand how we can use this because it seemed like products with CBD in them became legal really near to the time that so did growing hemp yeah. for that purpose. So there wasn't that time to really develop products and the infrastructure to support all that production too. Right and you know if you're driving down the road and you see the gas station with the CBD sign in the window. You don't really know what that is at this point because it's such a, a small market. But I think as more Americans become accustomed to CBD and we actually find a lot more uses for it because being from a previously legal plant, there wasn't a lot of research going on. Um, so I think we're gonna see that market increase, but I think in 2019, there was too much too soon and the market got flooded and unfortunately i think a lot of farmers had a bad experience well we'll continue to keep an eye on this lee do you have anywhere you can send people if they've got questions uh yeah just call your local extension office um, that's the one thing i can stress um, completely is call your local extension office they will get you in the right um, direction for resources um, and also Central State University, they have a hemp specialist. Um, so just call your local extension office. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.